Freelancing. Now, this is a thing we've said in previous videos. We said this is something that people even say when it's like the new word for unemployment. Oh, what are you doing nowadays? Uh, you don't want to say you're unemployed. You say, oh, I'm freelancing. However, in your case, it is freelancing. That is your job. And you are generally, from what I know, constantly swamped with work. So I would love to delve into some really great tips for the people out there that are freelancing or want to freelance. So the first thing that I want to talk about is quoting. Now this is a very kind of touchy subject for a lot of people, but that's even more reason for us to hopefully give some advice, give some experience to that topic. What would you say on tips on quoting? So we're specifically talking about quoting how much you're going to charge for your yes. work, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so that, that is very tricky. So the two considerations are, are you going to work on a per piece basis? You know, like you agree, okay, we need this piece and we're, we're going to pay you this amount for you to finish the piece. Or are you going to be uh, an hourly or a daily rate? And, you know, there, there are times and places and situations where maybe you would want to work per piece or maybe the people you're working for will insist on it. But I think we have to look at their point of view. They're budgeting. They need to know what they're in for. They need, let's say they need a character design. And so they need to budget how much is it going to cost to do this character design. And so they might work with a character artist and the artist will quote what it's going to cost to do a character design. And, and that'll be how it works. So maybe that'll make sense. But I'll tell you, uh, I never work like that, especially the kind of work I do um, uh, as, a, as a concept artist, visual development artist, and, and painter, because I'm in situations where uh, I, do, I do concept paintings and I do what we tend to refer to as color keys, quick rough paintings. Even though they're quick and rough, they're meant to establish the look of a scene, which is very important. And my very best speed in doing color keys, uh, under the right conditions, I can do maybe 30 in a week. And uh, for me, that's pretty fast. Uh, at the same time, there are situations where uh, maybe I'll start with two pieces. There's a couple of key establishing shots. And so maybe I'm going to do two color key roughs to establish the look for those. And so I'll do my two roughs, say, in a day. I'll work on them, do different versions, and then maybe present uh, different versions of the two. And the production designer will look at those and say, oh, yeah, I, I like them. You know, I have this select a suggestion, and maybe we could play this one a little bit brighter. So there's a few notes. You address those notes. And then we're very happy we show them to the director. And uh, show them to the director, and she says, oh, great, you know, um, I like them, but I have this suggestion, and we just had a story meeting, and your daytime sketch, guess what? It just turned to a nighttime scene. So could we talk you into redoing it as a nighttime scene? Okay. And I've literally had situations where maybe I'm capable of doing 20, 25, 30 in a week. I've had situations where we got done two in an entire week because they were key scenes they, the movie centered around these moments, and everyone needed to feel, director, producers, production designer, everyone needed to feel like, yes, we've really hit a special mark here. Well, wonder if I was charging per piece instead of per hour. You know, uh, some moments it might be pretty good, and some moments it would be a complete disaster, and I wouldn't be able to rely, you know, I mean, I, I, got, uh, I got bills to pay there's realities you know uh, i have a family and mortgage the whole thing i want you know I'm set something aside for the kids uh to go to college and even though you know it's it's not always about the income that's the reality of life and so for me it's always an hourly rate or a day rate uh, i usually quote a weekly rate you know here's here's what i charge per week 
And then it's broken down, you know, if, if there's any reason it needs to be broken down per day or even per hour, you just base it on that week, weekly rate and break it down from there. And so unless there's a, there, there may be a good reason not to do a weekly, daily or hourly rate, but that's where my recommendation is. And for those of you that can't do the daily rate or hourly rate because the, the client doesn't want to do that in some situations, right? Um, I think my suggestion would, uh, my suggestion has always been, I try to think about what their budget is instead of thinking about how much time am I going to spend on this? And okay, how much do I want to get paid per hour? And then times the hours by the hourly rate. And that's my quote, you know, that's, that's a bad move. Like Nathan was saying with revisions and everything, and especially with revisions, it's always a good idea if you're in that situation to write down how many revisions you plan on doing before having to tack on another fee. Right. Yeah. Now, um, tips on working remotely on a project, because that's very different. You, you, you know, it's not like you can just go into the director's uh, office or, or see that person, her or him, uh, multiple times in the day or uh, check in with other departments very quickly, things like that. When you are working on a project remotely, what are the things that kind of helped you what are the things that may maybe surprise you? Can we give some tips on that? Well, I, whenever I can, you know, it, it's great to work with new people in a new studio and that's important to do because it expands your horizon. And so I try and be conscientious of that. At the same time, there's always an awkwardness because a new group of people doesn't necessarily know what you do best or how you work best. And so, you know, it, it can happen. It has even happened where, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, look, the project looks good, the opportunity looks good, join up. And then, and then, they'll, uh, and then they'll say, hey, uh, could you design, uh, we, we have this character that hasn't been designed yet, and you, can you take a stab at it? And my thought is, have you seen my portfolio? You know, you, you know my work. I'm not primarily a character designer. I can paint characters. I, I paint them into my scenes all the time. But that's not my primary expertise, and it's not primarily what I do. And so you're kind of, you're, uh, you know, I, I say to them if it's appropriate, well, I, I guess I should say that I think this through first. That's a situation where I'm not going to look good because I'm not the best at doing that particular thing. It's going to take me longer than an experienced pro at that particular thing. And then I feel like where I wanted to come in, hit the ground running, and everyone feel like, yes, we hired the right person. Hey, you know, it's Nathan's been on for a week. He just turned in his first paintings. You know, everyone, what did Nathan turn in? What does it look like? You want it to be exceptional. You want everyone to feel like, oh, yeah, we hired the right guy. This is really great. And then you get set up for something that you can't excel at. And so I try as much as possible to make sure that everyone's very clear on what my strengths are. And I even fall back. I, I like to work with people that I've worked with before and they know what my strengths are. There's one particular production designer where uh, whenever he calls, you know, hey, Nathan, I, I, I'm on a new project. Uh, are you available? Sometimes I don't even ask what the project is first. I don't ask, oh, well, tell me about the project. You know, my first response is, uh, well, here's what my availability is. Let's, uh, uh, let's get together. Let's talk. Let's do this because uh, this person knows how to play to my strengths. And, uh, and uh, he, he passes me stuff that, that uh, he's confident that I can really lend myself to. And so it's a very comfortable working relationship. So uh, I try to balance those two things then. The other thing that uh, I'm okay with uh, in having no shame, I don't mind if there is an art director sketch or if there's something that's been established already. 
some artists are very determined, you know, I'm original, I do all original work, I want to be the complete upfront. That's great. You know, I, I do original concepts all the time. But working remotely, sometimes the art director, production designer, they need to do a little sketch. Just say, Nathan, you know, we have this idea and it's kind of the character, we're thinking a character will be here and it's this kind of a place. So we have this story idea, but we want you to run with it. Well, when you're working remotely and you don't have that in and out connection, you know, uh, where you can check in with them all the time easily, to know what their expectations are of you and them knowing where you're going, freelance working remotely goes so much smoother. And so I do original work. I I work with art director sketches, and then as we move into production, they send me animatic movies, you know, the rough 3D animatic movies that rough out the scenes, and I take those and I use those as a very rough layout, and then we'll do color keys based on those. And so at that point, I'm not expected to do original layout. I take those animatic frames, paint over top of them, and hopefully they're a thing of, you know, uh, color light, environment design, and compositional beauty, we hope, uh, painting over top of those animatics. But they know where I'm starting. I know what they expect. And then working from home is a smooth process that they're comfortable with. When you're talking about freelance, uh, one of the things that every, I'd say definitely like in the 90 percentile of freelance artists, there is at some point, there's a fear. Where's my next job going to come from? Because I don't work in-house, right? When do you know that you're ready for freelance? Or do you ever? This might be a question that we really don't have an answer to, but I would just love to hear your thoughts. You know, I recommend, uh, they always say in business, they always say to, uh, they always say to diversify. You know, because one thing will dry up and it'll be gone. And if that's all you have, you're gone too. And so that's that's definitely a major consideration. And so uh, one thing artists do, they um, yes, they're full-time artists, as am I. I, I work. Uh, it's a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing I don't have a lot of hobbies because you know uh, uh, I I do my art projects. And, uh, you know, I, I do my art projects, I've got my, my family life, and I don't need a whole lot outside of that because I do work full time, at least 40 hours a week, you know, doing artwork for the studios. Uh, we get into crunches and it can be quite a bit more than that. But at the same time, I'm doing my 40 plus hour week. Uh, I love teaching. I'm doing my school every week. I have a few, you know, I have a handful of students I spend a little time with each week. And uh, I've, I have some book projects. I put together a, a book that's out there. I'm working on another book. And uh, I have a gallery show coming up that I'm very excited about. And, uh, and so I have these other side projects. And they're, they're exciting. They lead to new opportunities. But each one of them also is a little income stream. You know, maybe it's not a lot, but it's a little income stream where if one thing uh, if if one thing might dry up or at least there's a gap, then I can focus my efforts on those other things uh, during that time period and at least there's something there. And so I, I strongly recommend, you know, uh, uh, teach, work on your book project, have your side projects, go to, you know, uh, have a booth at the convention. Some people make it, make a, uh, some people make a comfortable living just doing the convention circuit, you know, and do some freelance when they want to. And so uh, those other diverse opportunities, I think, will probably be necessary for any freelance artist trying to find their legs and trying to uh, get the uh, working on getting the range of contacts that will keep them busy on a regular basis. The Animation Union's website has uh, it has the union minimums, which is how much an artist must be paid for their work at a minimum, and that can go up from there. For freelance. And, uh, 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 well, this is this is working for the studios, ah. but 
freelance would be based on, you know, it would be, you could, you could chart it out. If I'm working a 40 hour week, how does that equate to what the studios and it applies to freelance as well. Anyway, so I point people to that. Uh, that's the obvious question. How much should I charge? And I don't want to give a definite answer to that. You can't do it. But that's the resource that I point people towards so they at least have a little bit of a ballpark. I might be totally wrong here, but I was always under the assumption that as a freelancer, you gotta, we generally charge more because we don't know where the next gig is going. We're paying for our own medical and all that stuff. And that's why, you know, as a freelancer, you generally charge more than how much people get paid weekly basis in a studio. That's that's absolutely true. And I had a I had a young guy. Um, he was asking me. Uh, he was a pretty good artist, but just starting. He said, "So I'm starting starting out freelance. I'm thinking of charging one hundred and fifty dollars an hour." And he was going to freelance for a standard animation company. And uh, wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. And and I said, "Well, th- think this through, okay? Let's say you you're, you're working with this company and and you're going to do regular work with them regularly. So let's say you do a forty hour week. That's probably what they'll expect you to do." And so $150 an hour, 40 hour a week, that's $6,000 a week. Guess what? Most art directors, production designers, even directors don't make $6,000 a week, you know. Uh, And he's like, oh, geez, I I didn't think of it like that. He said, well, I'm glad I talked to you because uh, uh, that's the amount I was going to give to them. And I know this company and I know that they would have laughed him off of, you know, they, they would have laughed him out of his rate because no one there gets that. So that was my thinking uh, about about the rate. I have heard of a couple uh, artists that do charge in that realm or maybe even slightly higher, but they are the top of the top, like in the whole entire planet. It's like number one and number two, those are the guys. On the flip side of that, it's kind of interesting because when I was speaking with another artist that has really high rates and he's been working with a studio for a very long time, this is in live action. He was saying, then the industry changed and now there's like a million more artists and it's a really hot kind of job. How is he going to lower those rates? You know, it's painful to lower them because he's still getting steady work from this one main studio, but it's not full time, right? And he's bringing in more work. How could he charge those new projects less than this one that's been super loyal to him, just, you know, always paying him top, top dollar? It wouldn't feel right. But then he wouldn't be able to get those other jobs if he didn't lower his rate. You know, so there is kind of like this thing where, and this is just my own kind of experience, my own thinking, but there is this thing where I feel like I want to charge a good rate that I feel is fair. And if I feel like I could get more, oftentimes I don't. If I have a really good rate already, I wouldn't actually chase for even more because of that story that my friend told me. Well, yeah, they uh, they might not ask for you next time. They'll say, we, we like Bobby, we'd prefer to have Bobby, but here's this other artist who's almost as good as Bobby, and the rate is significantly less, and we kind of need to go that route. Yeah, you, you, risk, uh, uh, you risk falling into that category. Well, thank you, Nathan, for the wonderful information. If anybody is interested in learning more with Nathan, but more about art, he has four... Five. I don't know how many classes you have on schoolism <laughs> nowadays, but they are um, by, all fantastic. Yeah, by the time I'm in the old folks' home, uh, who who knows who knows what the list will be? But yeah, we're we're having a great time. We, um, if you don't mind me saying so, Bobby, um, we all know we have to have foundational skills. Once you have the foundational skills of draftsmanship and, and such, um, you are uh, for for us to really compete in this market and do work that we're proud of. Uh, your color and light skills have to be stellar. Creating compelling, you know, uh, environments, uh, engaging environments, and then we're picture makers primarily as concept artists. So we have to be experts in composition uh, and designing pictures. And that's why th- those are my primary three classes in concept art. And that's why, because that's kind of the big trilogy 
of what will make us uh, the artists I think that we hope to be and the artists that will make us appealing to those good clients that we hope to work with. Hi, my name's Nathan Fawkes. I'm a concept artist in the entertainment industry. I've had the opportunity to work for animation studios where I've learned how to tell a story and how to reach out to an audience through designing with color and with light. And this has allowed me to contribute to projects that I am really proud of and that I hope you've enjoyed as well. I also work as a teacher. I've been hired by game and animation studios to teach their art departments theatrical design so that they can work towards creating visuals that thrill their audience. So now it's your turn. I've partnered with Schoolism to bring you this nine-week course where I'll share with you everything that I know about designing with color and with light. Over the course of the class, I'll show you how to brainstorm an idea and then go through the process of bringing meaningful color, light, and atmosphere to it. I'll show you how to break down a scene into powerful color and lighting statements. And I'll show you how to create emotional color beats and to expand those ideas into a color script that brings your project to life. We'll cover this and much more during our nine weeks together. So I'm looking forward to working with you personally. I'll be giving you critiques, doing paint overs of your homework so that I can give you specific suggestions and I'll be helping you to develop your concept art portfolio. Enrollment is limited, so sign up today and I will see you soon.